Okay, um, hello everyone and welcome to our very first live stream. You'll already have uh, seen both Cooper's Home and the very special edition of Cooper's Poems owned by Edward Knight, which made its way back to Chawton House at the beginning of this year. So next up, I'm joined by one of our trustees at Chawton House, Professor Karen O'Brien. Um, Karen is also a professor of English literature at the University of Oxford, and she is going to kick off the presentations from a number of academics that we have lined up for the day, who are going to talk about dis different aspects of Cooper's work. So, um, hello, Karen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you have the important role of prefacing these talks by explaining to us why it is that Cooper might matter today. Um, so Cooper becomes a, an important and a much loved poet during his own lifetime. What do you think it was that made his work so appealing and so accessible? Well, thank you, Kim. It's a great privilege to be here and what an exciting acquisition for Chawton House to bring Cooper home uh, to, to Chawton House because he was a poet that meant so much to the generation of Jane Austen's father, Jane Austen, and many generations subsequently. And I think that's for a variety of reasons. One of them was he was a highly contemporary poet, really embedded in his times, really conscious of his times, and yet very, a very accessible kind of writer who wrote from a strongly personal and private point of view. And he showed that in a way, an individual who has no special authority and no special insight into the contemporary world can still have a meaningful point of view and have something important to say. And I think that was one of the many ways in which he bridged the public and private world for so many readers who would read him aloud at home around the fireside. And, and on top of that, he had a wonderful sense of self-deprecation, a sense of humor, an ability to move between different registers, very grand, very intimate, uh, at, at the flick of a switch to move between ballads and hymns, blank verse, translations of Homer and more formal verse satires. So a really versatile, satisfying writer. Uh, and I think also very importantly, a humanitarian. He was someone who, and we'll say a bit more about this, was very interested in issues of freedom uh, and reducing cruelty in the society around him. And I think that resonated with a lot of people in the moment of the later 18th century. And most importantly of all, he was a memorable craftsman of poetry. He had a way of writing particularly blank verse in beautifully placing words in a, a non-pompous, exquisite way of writing, lovely, easy, flowing rhymed couplets, terrific hymns, and actually very memorable lines. So Kim, I'm just gonna quote you and remind our listeners how many memorable lines we all know from Cooper. Variety is the very spice of life. We all know the line, I'm monarch of all I survey. From his hymn, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. God made the country and man made the town. And then with reference to tea, the English pursuit of tea, the cups that cheer, but not inebriate. And I could go on, but he has entered the language. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think you get a real sense of how he's not a poet who's um, dealing with the sort of the heroics and instead is about um, or thinking about the kind of everyday in the place of the everyday man. Um, and I've, I've really enjoyed kind of getting to know Cooper a little bit better in putting this day together. And I've come to appreciate that there are tensions, I guess, in, in readings of him. So on the one hand, he's seen as someone who's isolated, um, who's confined, who's sort of hidden away from the world. Um, and then on the other hand, he's a deeply politically engaged poet who's very kind of connected to his society and to his moment and to certain causes. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the latter and about those causes that were important to Cooper. There were a very long list of causes. They had a common thread in a patriotic love of England and a sense that England could and should be better. And he, he had this view of England that it should be a place that's plain, hospitable and kind, but that in many instances it wasn't. So I think it's very, it's very well known. He was a fervent opponent of the transatlantic slave trade and he campaigned very actively and wrote very actively for the abolition of that trade. He was very concerned about needless warfare. Although having said that, the um, Godmersham volume and the subsequent volume of 1785, The Task, were written around the time uh, of the end of the American uh, Revolutionary War. And he was actually very disappointed uh, that the American colonies had broken away and become independent. That, that was something he did not support. 
he was very ahead of his time in being very concerned with the exploitation of Bengal by the East India Company. Uh, and that again was an issue rising up the political agenda in the 1780s and 90s. And he, he, he thought that this was going to be another highly exploitative colonial venture. And he spoke out about that. Also very ahead of his time in his concern for animal rights, his poem, The Task, makes his opposition to blood sports really clear and his concern about the treatment of horses. Decades ahead of Black Beauty, he wrote about the way that horses were uh, used cruelly in, in everyday life. He was concerned with corrupt clergymen uh, and corrupt politicians. And he took a huge interest in global exploration, the Cook Voyages to the Pacific, for example, but at the same time, he could see the potential for that exploration for further global inequality and exploitation. Mm. So that's a kind of remarkably nuanced attitude to empire. Um, and I think, you know, a, a critique of what's happening away, away from home, but also um, affected through a critique of kind of luxury, um, I suppose, um, at, at home as well. Um, it was interesting you talking about the animals too. I know he kept three hares um, and was very fond of them. Um, and I suppose that brings us home in some ways. So although he's, um, although he's writing about these very kind of global concerns, um, he is living a kind of very uh, retired life, I suppose. And do you get the sense that he saw this disengagement as, as kind of problematic in any way? I think he thought there was a consistency between the values that he puts around domesticity in the countryside and his political values. But at the same time, I think he could see how uh, that very private life, that celebration of a very reserved, withdrawn, self-sufficient life that wasn't about being economically productive and wasn't about political opposition. It really was about withdrawing into a small, quiet circle. He could see... Uh, that that in a way was a kind of vicarious and at a remove way of, of dealing with politics. I think what comes across with Cooper is that that domestic life is very hard won, very fragile. Uh, it, it's based in a very precarious kind of religious faith uh, and it's based in a love of nature. Nature, on the other hand, is portrayed as sometimes subject to extreme weather, extreme storms. So there's an, an analogy, I think, between the nature of home and the political world that he thinks about. But I think more in more modern terms, he understood more than any poet in the 18th century that public life was mediated by the new media age. So there are quite a few passages in his poems about newspapers and about reading about public uh, events in, in the luxury of your sitting room by the fire with a newspaper in front of you. And there's this whole world out there. Uh, and there's this readily accessible communication network of these newspapers, uh, and there you are experiencing them vicariously. And I'm going to read you a very short passage where he describes this, because this is the, um, this is the poet thinking about the ethics of distance and the ethics of global responsibility in a media age where you get to know what's happening in the world, but you're sitting at home. He says, "'Tis pleasant through the loopholes of retreat to peep at such a world, to see the stir of the great Babel and not feel the crowd, to hear the roar she sends through all her gates at a safe distance, where the dying sound falls a soft murmur on the uninjured ear. Thus sitting, thus surveying, thus at ease, the globe and its concerns, I seem advanced to some secure and more than mortal height that liberates me and exempts me from them all." It's liberating, it's pleasurable, it's exempting, you feel responsible, you have no responsibility. I think he understood all of those paradoxes of global sensibility in a media age. And how poignant that seems uh, for right now, I suppose, at a time when we've all been forced to be kind of yes. uh, retired in this way. Um, so, I mean, he, he does write very strongly and in a very strong voice about some of those causes that you mentioned earlier. I'm thinking particularly about his abolition. But despite um, the kind of strength of this political voice, he's also, as you said earlier, um, self-deprecating. You know, he's, he's foregrounding a sense of vulnerability or maybe even inadequacy. And do you think this was unusual for the time? Um, was, it, was it part of his appeal? I do think it was unusual. Many people, particularly from his evangelical Christian background, would write spiritual autobiographies where they would describe how they fell into a despair and an isolation and then they had a religious conversion. And thereafter, through various troughs and various peaks, they maintained a kind of equilibrium. 
And Cooper, in a posthumously published prose account of his early life and his early suicide attempts and his conversion, uh, it's called Adelphi, did describe this process. But there is something I think very different about Cooper's approach to all of this. It's something that moves beyond the conversion narrative that suggests that this equilibrium is completely unresolved. And that the frankness with which he talks in all of his poems about his mental fragility, his mental health, is really, really striking. So the famous line in the poem, The Task, where he describes that tremendous breakdown he had before he was rescued by a doctor. I was a stricken deer that left the herd long since. He talks in The Task about, uh, about him being someone that attends to his interior self, that has a heart and keeps it. And he always foregrounds this sense of being inexperienced, defeated, excluded from comfortable society. And he's very drawn to images of really extreme isolation. So the comfortable, cozy man who sits by the fire and reads the newspaper is also the man who is obsessed with images of shipwreck and of being tossed around at sea. So there's a very famous poem. Uh, the, the verse is supposed to be written by Alexander Selkirk, the man who was shipwrecked and who was the basis for Robinson Crusoe. There's another poem called The Castaway about a man who is, who is accidentally tossed overboard in a ship and the crew can't rescue him. And at the end of that poem, Cooper says, I beneath a rougher sea am whelmed in deeper gulfs than he. And there's an early poem, a very disturbing poem, uh, which ends where he describes himself as being, he says, I in a fleshly tomb am buried above ground. And one of the most striking of all of his poems is a poem that describes him suddenly in late middle age receiving the first ever visual image he ever had of his mother, his mother who died when he was six, I think was very much behind the enduring mental poor health that he had. Uh, and suddenly this picture arrives and he relives this intense pain of loss of his childhood. And he describes himself as tempest tossed. So the, the, the world of, of, of only and of the, of the natural world is also for Cooper a world of being tossed in a sea and feeling as though you're an outcast uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a living world and constantly subject to storms. And I think if we connect this back to Jane Austen, I, I feel sure that what connects her to him more than anything is that very strong sense in Cooper of the striving for happiness, how fragile that can be, how much one has a right to do that, uh, how there are religious foundations to that striving, but they, they may not be very secure. I think Cooper lost his faith, despite what he says in his poems, uh, and he had to find other ways of stabilizing himself. And there's a kind of emotional honesty about the need for individual happiness that I think resonated with everyone. And I know it resonated with Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. And still, I think, would, is resonant today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's, a, Absolutely. it's an amazing image of um, somebody who I guess has a lot of humility in being able to write about these very different um, uh, kind of moods that he has access to. Um, so Karen, I'm afraid we've run out of time. It just goes so quickly, doesn't it? Um, I think um, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, hearing hearing some of your thoughts on Cooper and thank you so much for opening up um, so many of the discussion points that will inform the rest of the talks today. Um, so next up, we're going to be moving on to talk about um, Cooper and abolition. Um, but for now, Karen, I'll say thank you very much um, and I will see you soon.